Our presenter today is Kate Bowles. Kate is the George O'Keefe Museum's Cultural Landscape 2019 Fellow. The George O'Keefe Cultural Landscapes Fellowship at the Abiquiu Home and Studio was supported in part by the National Park Service, Intermountain Region's Heritage Partnership Program. Kate is a graduate architecture student at the University of New Mexico. She returned to school after working in Santa Fe architecture and landscape architecture firms and becoming a New Mexico licensed landscape architect. She is particularly interested in the intersection of historic preservation, ecology, landscape architecture, and architecture in the face of climate change. Kate holds a master in, master's in landscape architecture and a certificate in historic preservation from the University of Virginia and a BA in biochemistry and cell biology and a BS in ecology and evolutionary biology from Rice University. Please welcome Kate. Hello, everyone. All right, let's get started. Let me share my screen. Okay, so hello again, and thank you, Shannon, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I'm very excited to share with you all a little bit of the research I've been doing on O'Keeffe's Abiquiu property over the past year. So first off, I'd like to say thank you to the many people that shared their own research with me uh, or assisted me with my research. Thanks to the museum and the other research teams, the University of New Mexico, and especially as Shannon mentioned, the National Park Service Heritage Partnerships Program for funding the project. I'd like to specifically thank my direct supervisors, Julie McGilvery and Stephanie Wilson, for their guidance, support, and encouragement. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Pita and Maggie and Nino Lopez for generously sharing some of their knowledge of the property from the many years they worked for O'Keefe and continue to care for the property for the museum. So many of you might be wondering, what is a cultural landscape? So broadly, the Cultural Landscape Foundation states that cultural landscapes are landscapes that have been affected, influenced, or shaped by human involvement. The National Park Service uses the more targeted definition of a cultural landscape as a geographic area, including both cultural and natural resources and the wildlife or domestic animals therein, associated with a historic event, activity, or person, or exhibiting other cultural or aesthetic values to determine which cultural landscapes should be listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which is managed by the National Park Service. Historically significant cultural landscapes can be listed as historic sites or historic districts. Not only is the O'Keeffe Abiquiu property listed on the National Register of Historic Places, it is a designated National Historic Landmark, it was listed in 1998, meaning it is res uh, recognized as having national, not just state and local significance, as well as high integrity. The main reason the Abiquiu property is significant is that it was O'Keeffe's permanent residence from 1949 to 1984. After O'Keeffe moved to New Mexico from New York City in 49, she typically spent summers at her, at her ghost ranch property near what is now Abiquiu Reservoir and winters here at her Abiquiu property. She moved to Santa Fe in 84 to be closer to medical care and spent two years there before passing away in 86. One of the tools the National Park Service uses to study cultural landscapes is the Cultural Landscape Report. This report documents, analyzes, and evaluates a cultural landscape and is the primary guide to treatment and use of a cultural landscape. The report typically consists of the following sections. Documentation and evaluation, which includes site history, existing conditions, analysis, and evaluation, followed by treatment recommendations, and then a record of treatment. During the time the foundation and now the museum own the property, a lot of really great studies have been conducted. However, a cultural landscape study is needed to research the property overall. During the fellowship, I focused on the site history portion of the study, uh, which will be the foundation later sections of the study build upon. Today, I will be presenting on how the buildings, topography, vegetation, and water and circulation systems on the Abiquiu property changed over time. Most of the research focused on vegetation changes from 46 to 49, 
So I will go into more depth for that topic, and that's the construction period. But first, a little about how I came to work on this project. I was first introduced to the Abbott Q property back in around 2015 while I worked on an um, historic structures report for the house and studios with Spears Horn Architects. Since then, I returned to school to pursue a master's in architect architecture, as Shannon mentioned, and I was reintroduced to this project through participation in the 2019 UNM Cultural Landscapes of George O'Keefe summer course taught by Julie McGilvery and Francisco Vigna. During the class, we got to spend two days on the property, and one of the highlights was looking into the well in the patio, which is normally covered, and that's shown here. The summer class was part of a larger vision, a course series created and funded in partnership with the National Park, the National Park Service and the Giorgio O'Keefe Museum was developed at University of New Mexico School of Architecture and Planning to study the Abiquiu property, the Ghost Ranch property, and areas in northern New Mexico influential to O'Keefe's art and life. Each year, this study site of focus for the, um, for the year will be introduced with a one-week summer class. Then the George O'Keefe Cultural Landscape Fellowship is awarded to a full-time student from the class for the following academic year. The courses and fellowships study O'Keefe's relationship to the landscape and culture of northern New Mexico and will result in a series of cultural landscape studies that will guide the George O'Keefe Museum in the care of O'Keefe's properties. <coughs> Excuse me. Lucky for me, I was selected to be the first fellow and I am thrilled and grateful to work on this project and it has been an incredible experience. A little bit about the project scope and methods. So from August 2019 until May 2020, I worked 20 hours a week on this project while continuing my architecture studies. I worked on my own, but all, checked in frequently with my team of Julie, Francisco, and Margaret, and occasionally with other professionals. I also worked closely with the museum staff on the property and in the archives. I read books about Abiquiu and O'Keefe. I read uh, professional reports about the property, performed on-site research and documentation, like measuring the spreads of all of the trees, and conducted a lot of archival research. The main archival sources that I relied on were historic photographs and design plans, interviews conducted during an oral history project by the museum, garden receipts, other ephemeral materials such as seed catalogs, and most importantly, letters exchanged between George O'Keefe and Maria Chabot, the woman who worked closely with O'Keefe to design and construct the house, studio, and landscape. It, pro it proved crucial to have the full final version letters Chabot mailed to O'Keefe. So many thanks to Sarah Roving for accessing the letters at the Yale Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library and sharing them with me. My research started <clears throat> with learning about Abiquiu. As a relative newcomer to New Mexico, I didn't know much about the history of Abiquiu. For those of you who may also not be familiar with Abiquiu, it's located in northern New Mexico along the Rio Chama, about a two hour drive northwest of Santa Fe. Although there's evidence of Native American presence in the area since at least 9,000 BCE, Puebloan occupation of the area was highest from around 1,300 to 1,445 CE. By the time the Spanish arrived 100 years later in 1540 looking for gold, the lower Chama was virtually abandoned. Following a mission to convert Native Americans to Christianity, the Spanish built missions at existing pueblos. The first Spanish settlement in New Mexico was in 1598 at Yungue Pueblo, which the Spanish renamed San Gabriel. After uh, almost 150 years later, in 1734, the Spanish founded Santa Rosa de Lima de Abiquiu up here, which is close to present day Abiquiu. Abiquiu, although small, was an important strategic location for Spanish and later Mexican and American occupation of New Mexico. Conflict between the Spanish settlers and the local Native Americans made living at Santa Rosa de Lima de Abiquiu perilous. In part, to establish a protective barrier between the two group groups, in 1754, the governor granted land at present-day Abiquiu to a group of Geniceros, detribalized Native Americans. After Mexican independence from Spain in 1821, Abiquiu was a governmental ayuntamiento of the district of Villa de Santa Cruz de la Cañada. Later in 1846, when the Spanish, uh, sorry, when the U.S. claimed the territory of New Mexico, General Kearney sent troops to Abiquiu 
and the U.S. Indian Agency was headquartered there until 1872. Abiquiu was also a key departure point for travelers on the Old Spanish Trail to California and later during the California Gold Rush. Three popular trail routes seen here with the, the dotted line departed from Abiquiu. So located at 6,050 feet above sea level with 12 to 18 inches of annual precipitation, Abiquiu is a high desert. However, it was not always so. As early land masses shifted, and this red is uh, New Mexico, the outline of present-day New Mexico. As early land masses shifted, the area of present-day New Mexico was at times covered by shallow seas before tectonic plate convergence created mountains. These changes over many millions of years led to the formation of the geology of the area. Periods of sedimentation left different types of soil, that bands of different types of soil that created these color bands that are ultimately one of the key things that drew O'Keefe to New Mexico. In this arid environment, water is life. Human settlements have followed waterways, as you may have noticed a few slides back. In the Abiquiu area today, right here, farming is often located near the Rio Chama, as it is the main water source for the fields. The hilltop village of Abiquiu is supplied by a spring-fed Abiquiu Creek, which is a drainage from the hills around the caldera. Both Abiquiu and the farms employ traditional Spanish acequia ditch irrigation systems to extend the irrigable area. The O'Keefe property, seen here in this detailed image, is the last property on the Abiquiu acequia to receive water before the acequia terminates into desagües, the red dashed lines, which are drainage ditches, in the arroyos on either side of the property. Just a fun story here, um, right here, just downstream from a geothermal spring that keeps the water in this branch of the creek warm on the lower, uh, sorry, the bottom left corner of your screen, there is a big patch of watercress that O'Keefe used to have harvested for her salads. The availability of water at the Abiquiu property was one of the key factors that led O'Keefe to purchase it. O'Keefe first visited New Mexico in 1917. She returned in 1929 and 30 staying with Mabel Dodge Lujan. After first visiting Ghost Ranch up here in 1934, O'Keefe began spending summers there. While O'Keefe was a paying tenant, the property owner, Arthur Pack, provided a ration of vegetables for, from his garden. However, this stopped in 1940 when O'Keefe purchased the Ghost Ranch house. Given the property was not located near a water source and was very remote, it made both growing food and traveling to purchase food difficult. The World War II food rationing, which O'Keefe mentions here, compounded the issue, and in 1942, O'Keefe, with Maria Chabot's help, began searching for a second property in New Mexico. O'Keefe looked at more than 20 properties in the Barranca and Abiquiu area down here along the Rio Chama. Uh, a 1942 letter to Chabot reveals the Abiquiu property may not have been O'Keefe's first choice at the time, as O'Keefe wrote, quote, I think of Barranco and goats, and I build a house on Mrs. What's-Her-Name's cliff looking over the river, and I think of Abiquiu and wish the Abiquiu well were in the other town, end quote. O'Keefe purchased the property, the Abiquiu property here, in 1946. So shown here is a current plan of O'Keefe's Abiquiu property. The major components of the spatial organization of the site are indicated by red outlines, and the zones within those spaces are shaded light red. So up here is the highway, and then Bodie's, if you're familiar with the area, would be on the upper left sort of area of the screen. And here's the entrance road into Abiquiu, and then here's the main driveway. There's a service road over here as well. And then here's the main house with the patio in the center, the studio with the motor court between the two connected to the garage. There's also a bomb shelter that's underground in the slope on the north here. Uh, what we used to be a former corral here. The laundry area is over here. And there's some terraces along the side of the East Arroyo here. There's another Arroyo over here. And then this whole area is the main um, South Garden. 
So it's thought that the original five-room Abiquiu house was built in 1744 by Miguel Montoya, 10 years prior to the Abiquiu land grant and 10 years after the nearby Santa Rosa de Lima de Abiquiu land grant to Bartolome Trujillo and nine others. In the mid 1800s, the Trujillo family, on the left here, owned the western portion of what eventually became O'Keeffe's property, and the Manzanares family owned the eastern portion. From 1874 to 1941-42, the property effectively remained within, so these three diagrams here, effectively remained within the same extended family because Elicio Salazar, and who owned the west side, and Jose Maria Chavez Jr. both married into the Manzanares family. And later, Martin Bodie married Alicio Salazar's granddaughter. At some point, the Salazars moved to Taos, and the Chavez family, which only owned the east side, began occupying the entire property before moving out in the 1920s. After which, the property was at times vacant, over here, uh, and at times rented or loaned to others, including Sheriff Maestas and Joe Ferran. The property had to use water from the acequia in order to maintain water rights. When Jose Maria Chavez passed away, Bodhi became the administrator of the estate, the eastern portion of the property. Just a few later, years later, in 41-42, Bodhi deeded both portions of the property to the Archbishop of Santa Fe, from whom O'Keefe purchased the property four years later. She purchased the east and west arroyos later than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. When O'Keefe purchased the property, it was dilapidated. Some portions were in ruin and others were still habitable. She spent three years from 46 to 49, fixing the house up and renovating it, but keeping the overall plan very similar to as she found it. This diagram shows where walls, fences, and buildings were constructed. In 1946, a garden wall was built, shown here with this green line. It was rebuilt and two walls were added around the former corral. In 1949, it appears a fence was added to the East Arroyo. An underground bunker, sorry, bomb shelter, was built around 1960, and fences were added in the 70s to enclose a yard for O'Keefe's chow dog, dogs, plural. While the Chavez family lived in the property, again, around the late 1800s to the 1920s, they brought in rich soil for the then terraced garden. When Joe Ferran was gardening there around 1936, he broke up those terraces and kept pigs in the southeast area of the garden. During construction, Chabot struggled with the soil and topography of the site. In 1946, she undertook a major leveling of the North Hill, the East Driveway, the South Garden, and the North Edge of the Corral. In 1949, she terraced the South Garden. Both the South Garden and the back corral garden had tierra blanca, hard pan under the topsoil, which made growing certain plants difficult. So the photo on the left here was taken in 46 by Chabot. It's looking east along the north slope of the property. The old garage is visible in the upper right, and the photo also shows the slope of the north hill before Chabot leveled the top of the hill. The photo on the right was likely taken just after construction because no plants are present and the remnants of the old corral wood structure are visible on the left adjacent to the new studio. The north wall of the back garden, as I mentioned, was installed in 1946. You can see it right here. Before, there was a steep slope to the north of the old corral. And here you can see the new earth ramp, quote, ramp, that, that's what Chabot called it, and stairs that Chabot designed to deal with the changing grade. The stones in the wall and the pattern they were laid in are unique on this property. In the upper inset detail, you can see the herringbone pattern of the piedras planchudas, also called relumbrosas. Each stone was hand-selected from local arroyos and hills. In her letters, Chabot described them as, quote, fire-like stones that glisten, and quote, also blue stones, and, quote, smooth, smooth, flat, pretty stones, end quote. Interestingly, Chabot wasn't happy with how the wall turned out and had it mudded over. However, at some point, the mud washed off <clears throat> and the stones were revealed as seen in this photo from around 1965. It appears the mud coating was not reapplied and the bottom photo, you can see the walls today. 
the ball today. The views and vistas were an important driver for changes O'Keefe and Chabot made to the property. Chabot wrote about citing the studio and O'Keefe's bedroom out on the edge of the hill and adding large windows to both rooms to capitalize upon the amazing north and east views. Chabot also wrote about highlighting views of the Pink Mesa, which is over here to the northwest, and of what she called the Don Simon Mesa over here to the southeast of the, and over the garden wall. An important counterpart to accentuating beautiful views was also to hide distracting views from features from view. This blue dashed line indicates a screen, an intentional screen, vegetation screen. <clears throat> and Chabot wrote about adding vegetation to intentionally screen the west view in particular. Views from inside the house into the gardens and outdoor rooms were also important design features. Chabot wrote about carefully orchestrating the view of the back garden from the north kitchen window, which is view number five right here. She designed the back wall as a dominant horizontal feature in the view and also added a line of tamarisks behind the wall to terminate the view and screen the town. This photo shows the north vista from near where the studio is today. <clears throat> today, there is more vegetation on the hilltop, partially obscuring the view. In this photo, you can also see the vent on the roof of the underground bomb shelter. Notice that the edge of the slope is closer to the viewer than in the historic photo. It's partly the, I know the, the views and the photos aren't quite the same, but it's a little bit closer uh, because a portion of the hill had to be regraded to provide access to the bomb shelter door. This 1952 photo shows the open vista towards the west from right in front of the kitchen. The back garden is visible in the lower right corner and the clothesline is behind. You can see the pink mesa Chabot wanted to maintain views of as well as Miguel Gonzalez's house uh, she wanted to screen from view, possibly to provide O'Keefe with privacy. Here's a similar view today, taken from slightly further back uh, or east, showing vegetation in the West Arroyo that has grown to block views of the buildings to the west as intended, but also blocking the Pink Mesa. This photo looking west across the property <coughs> excuse me, was likely taken soon after construction was completed as the plants are still small. It can be understood that the view east from this property, so standing on this driveway and looking back towards the camera, at this time was very open. The east arroyo is visible in the foreground and there aren't any trees in the arroyo. So this next section of the presentation will provide a more detailed look at how the vegetation changed on the property from before the start of construction to present day. For the cultural landscape study, this information will be paired with research Margaret Menashe is doing. She's identifying the plants on the property, assessing their current condition, and will be working with the team to make recommendations for vegetation management. After arriving in New Mexico in, on March 1st, 1946, the first action Chabot took on the Abiquiu property was cutting down uh, shade trees, as well as some fruit trees in the garden which is right here. There's the house, there's what became the studio, and there's the South Garden, and here's the house and the studio and the South Garden later. <clears throat> According to Chabot, this made the garden feel bigger and opened up beautiful views from the garden to surrounding features, some of which I've mentioned. These two aerial images compare the property before the trees were removed in 1935 with after construction was complete or almost complete in 49 and you can see how much more open it is. This diagram is a synthesis of information from letters written during construction, information from historic aerials and other fo historic photographs, and analysis of the existing trees in the garden today. The locations of the red circles uh, are approximate. It might be a little bit hard to see, but I didn't want to gray out the aerial. I wanted you to be able to see the 1949 aerial. Um, and they represent trees that were likely present before construction started, but are no longer present today. The green circles indicate trees present before construction that are still present today. 
and they include right here the tamarisk outside of the sitting room window, the mulberry in the center of the garden, the two mulberries along the south wall, and a tamarisk to the west of the lower bedroom, which was formerly known as the goat room, and an ancient fig in, over here. There are also descriptions of walnut trees and a grape arbor present on the property sometime before O'Keefe purchased it, but their locations are unknown. These photos by Maria Chabot show the South Garden before construction began. So <clears throat> here's the sitting room window in this photo, and here's the sitting room window in this photo, and this would be the roofless room. The left photo is taken from the southwest corner of the garden looking northeast. The right photo is the opposite, taken from the southeast corner looking northwest. The tree shadows were helpful when paired with other sources to verify that certain trees were present at this time. These photos also show the lack of other plants in the garden, indicating that almost everything that is there today was planted after O'Keefe purchased the property. The bottom two photos show the garden looking northeast after construction was complete. The old tamarisk, the one on the far left and the one on the far right are visible. And a 1952 photo shows the old tamarisk south of the sitting room window, which you can see right there. These photos show the old lilac mentioned in the letters and noted on many of Chabot's plans. So, <clears throat> excuse me. O'Keefe and Chabot began discussing plans for the property before O'Keefe finalized the purchase. Chabot's first known plans for the garden are the top left and top middle plans from February 5th, 1946. For all of these diagrams, the red, uh, circles indicate existing trees on the property before O'Keefe purchased it, like the ones I've been mentioning. That's what the numbers correlate to in the past slide. Uh, and the green circles are fruit trees. The blue lines are row crops and the yellow lines indicate a grape trellis. The majority of the new trees in the plan are fruit trees, the green circles, a crop that Chabot was especially passionate about. The idea of evenly spacing trees along the perimeter of the garden developed early on, although Chabot did experiment with designing clusters of trees as seen in the top left plan. Chabot considered planting dwarf trees, dwarf fruit trees as well, but ruled that out after talking with an expert. Another common idea in these plans is the intention to plant berries and row crops in the southeast corner of the uh, garden, separated from the west section of the garden by a grape trellis. Chabot thought there would be good soil quality there, good quality soil there, because it's where the pigs had been kept. The idea to have a rose circle seems to have been introduced in 48. The 49 aerial right here shows a circular feature in that same location as in the 49 plan, so some portion of that idea was realized. The following diagrams indicate plantings documented by archival research. In this diagram of Chabot's 46 garden plan, the red, um, sorry, the red again indicates existing trees. The orange is for trees that may or may not have been planted by Chabot. I couldn't really pin that down. And the green and the blue are both for trees that were planted in March of 46. They're just two different dates within March. Chabot did not intend to have a vegetable garden in 46, calling it a quote, burden, end quote, given how much work she had ahead of her on the house. However, she did plant 200 strawberry plants in the former pig area, but those plants struggled to survive in the soil. Uh, O'Keefe wrote Chabot that, quote, weeping willow, it is the tree I am most interested, end quote. So Chabot planted a willow in the Don Simon corner. You can see she wrote Don Simon down here, replacing it the following year in 47, after the first one was eaten, uh, the roots. She planted additional willows in the West Arroyo in 47, and she frequently updated O'Keefe about the condition of the willows. So not much documented planning took place in 47. That doesn't necessarily mean that nothing was planted, but the letters um, don't reveal that to be the case, as well as other, other sources. <laughs> The plantings that did take place were focused on the west side of the property, mainly to screen, screen views to the west, as I've mentioned before, 
and also to colonize an existing garbage pit in the Arroyo Bottom. Some of the tamarisks along the west garden wall, these red circles, may have been planted in 47. By the fall, um, sorry, in the fall, Chabot planted 30 raspberry plants somewhere uh, that were a gift from Doris Bree. In 47, after receiving a postcard from the Cleveland Museum um, of one of O'Keeffe's white flowers, Chabot was inspired by O'Keeffe's art and wrote, quote, I think we're going to have some datura in the Abiquiu Garden and some blue morning glories, end quote. Around 1949, O'Keeffe also tried to plant many of the flowers she painted, but they did not survive. Later in life, she wrote, quote, I have tried to find a black iris bulb, but could not. Once someone gave me an address for it, but I lost the address and forgot who gave it to me, so I've had nowhere, so I've never had a plant for the garden, end quote. This 1948 garden plan by Chabot is the first to indicate how the inner portion of the garden could be laid out, including possible paths or walls maybe here and rectangular garden beds. The, rectangular, the rectangles, the horizontal ones here, may be the quote, series of long narrow wheat fields, end quote, Chabot wrote about in a letter the prior year. In 1948, it was likely the first year a vegetable garden was planted, which makes sense as it was the first year O'Keeffe lived in the house. Insight into the circular form on the left here is provided by a letter from O'Keeffe to McBride, quote, my onion patch is round and about 15 feet across, a rose in the middle of it, end quote. In this diagram, the pink and red circles represent trees that were planted before um, 1948 and the green circles represent fruit and nut trees planted in 1948. So you can see a majority of the, the new plants were uh, fruit or nut trees. It is unclear whether the tamarisks, the brown ones, and the uh, few of the other ones, the yellow ones, were planted or when they were planted. So this slide is not meant to overwhelm you. <laughs> Don't get scared. Um, this slide is included just to show the astounding variety and quantity of plants that were planted in the garden. All of the bold text indicates different types of plants. And these are all quotes directly from um, the letters between Maria Chabot and George O'Keefe. As New Mexico gardeners will understand, it is not likely to, that all of the plants survived in the harsh New Mexico climate. Others may have been removed over many years O'Keeffe lived on the property, or they may have died. So Chabot's 1949 garden plan focused on the vegetable garden. By overlaying trees from the 1948 diagram that I just showed you on this plan, a fuller picture of the garden in 49 emerges. It is unclear why Chabot did not draw in all of these trees. She did draw a few of them. You can see these dots but it simply, maybe it wasn't her focus in the plan or maybe they didn't survive. In the lower right corner of the plan, Chabot listed plants for the back garden, the former corral. So we know that they were planted there or that they were intended to be planted there. A large 75 plant um, circle of roses was intended for the east portion of the main south garden. But on May 5th, Chabot wrote, quote, the circle looks odd with two roses in it, end quote, and it appears the design was never fully realized. Low plant av availability at the nurseries led to fewer uh, roses arriving in Abiquiu than Chabot and O'Keefe wanted. One April 27th receipt for 14 roses says, quote, all sold out until fall, unquote, and another April 14th receipt has a note saying, quote, sorry, these are the only two you listed we still have in stock, end quote. And those two roses might be the two that Chabot mentioned. O'Keefe uh, was very involved with selecting roses for the Abiquiu Garden. The bloom color appears to be, have been an important factor for O'Keefe during the selection process, but she also considered other factors, like if it was a climbing rose or not. Some of the other ornamental plants O'Keefe especially liked and mentioned in letters in later years include weeping willow, um, oriental poppies, datura, and according to O'Keefe, quote, the only flowers I like and grow willingly in my garden, end quote, chrysanthemums and iris. 
But the garden was primarily a vegetable, fruit, and herb garden where O'Keefe could grow healthy things she enjoyed eating and serving to guests. So these photos seem to correlate well with the 1949 garden plan we just saw. The rows of corn match the location of the corn in the plan, roughly, and a line of ornamental flowers, you can see them all along here in this detail photo, uh, correspond with a line of chrysanthemums in the plan. Here is a similar view from 1979, so 30 years later. I learned from speaking with Pita and Maggie and Mino that there was a squash garden in the middle right area of the photo around this, uh, right, right here around this time. From the 1950s until 1981, Esteban Suazo was O'Keeffe's gardener. Esteban's grandson, Margarito, Maggie Lopez, started helping in the garden full time just a year or two prior to Esteban's death and still tends the garden today. Starting in 2014, high school student interns have designed, planted, and tended the vegetable garden as a local community partnership that maintains the practice, if not the specific plants, of vegetable gardening on the property. This 1979 aerial and the one on the following page show how different the character of the southeast corner of the garden, right here, was during O'Keeffe's lifetime compared to today because the trees, for example, the blue spruce, which you can see right here, remained fairly small during O'Keeffe's lifetime, this section received far more light than it does today, surrounded by mature trees. The view and the experience of the space was more open. Plants that would have thrived in the sunny garden during O'Keeffe's lifetime could eventually have been shaded out. It is logical to guess that O'Keeffe wanted the space to be shaded since she planted trees that are very large when mature. However, no record of this um, intention has been found yet. Here is a second uh, 1979 aerial, this time looking northwest. So here's the southeast corner of the garden and that right there is that uh, blue spruce tree. So this plan is a compilation of changes to the vegetation on the property over time. The shaded circles represent plants that are present today. So everything that's shaded is present today. The fill color indicates what year they were planted. And I know it might be hard to, to read this, but it's more supposed to just indicate that there are um, things that were planted before. Most of the plants in the southeast section of the garden were planted after 49 as indicated by the dark green color. That means anything, anything that's dark green is after 49. The red circles represent plants uh, that were planted by Chabot and O'Keefe between 46 to 49 that are no longer present today. The majority of them are over here. They're fairly light. The locations of these trees is approximate, but it does show that the southwest portion of the garden down here was more densely planted than it is today. Not as much information was found about the plants outside of the South Garden, but from conversations with Maggie, I learned that the, all of the um, shaded plants on the property, as I mentioned, were there before he started working there. The only exceptions are a few plants shaded lighter green, which are this one right here, this one right here, and one over here. This plan does not include the plants in the Arroyos, some of which were planted, but most of which are invasive volunteers. In order to grow a garden in New Mexico, irrigation is needed. <laughs> this plan shows the open ditch uh, irrigation system on the property. The basic concept of the system that is still in place today was sketched by Chabot in 46. You can see that in the upper left. The acequia enters the property in the middle of the south garden wall and also under the east driveway. A system of ditches with gates, the gates are orange, is used to direct flood, uh, water to flood irrigate different sections of the garden. Overflow is directed into the east and west arroyos with this red line. In addition to the acequia irrigation system, there were three other piped water systems, at least three. As early as 46, Chabot considered systems for fire protection and drinking water. After concerns that 
the acequia wouldn't provide enough water, a cistern and a pump were installed in the East Arroyo to collect spring water. You can see that over here. The existing well was cleaned out, the well's right here, in 47 to reveal 11 feet of spring-fed water in the well. Pipes and a pump were added to the well in 48. This plan shows a diagram of the planned uh, hot and cold water pipes to the house supplied by the well. However, the town water system, brainstormed by Chabot and Bodie in 46, was installed and functional by the end of 48, rendering the cistern and the well less important. The raised path in the garden act as boundaries between different irrigation zones. So they're the red lines, um, <laughs> most of the red lines. The basic concept of the current circulation system was also developed during the construction period as shown in this 1949 plan diagram. So you can see the similarities between the 49 plan and the 79 aerial here. And just note that north in this, on these two is actually down at the bottom of your screen compared to on the previous pages, north was up. So you just, this is the studio here. These photos show the dirt raised past in the garden right here, these little berms, and the dirt retaining wall along the edge of the suelo path. So Mino and Joseph rebuilt the paths and walls with rock and concrete around 79 to make it easier for O'Keefe to walk there. Today, the circulation is very similar to what it was while O'Keefe lived on the property. However, some of the paths indicated on the plan by the dashed red line, so this path here on the slope, and then there's a few stepping stone paths in the, in the garden, one here, one here, and one here. Some of those paths have disappeared from view partially under overgrown vegetation and sediment. So this, this photo right here shows some of the stepping stones um, right here on this terrace. And you can see they're kind of sinking or get, slowly getting covered up, harder to find. A few things have been added, like the tiny steps along the path to the bomb shelter to make it the path easier for visitors to navigate. Lastly, I wanted to share a little bit about some of the small scale features on the site because I think the stories around these objects are really interesting. This unassuming metal trash can, this one that's there, it's a half of a trash can actually, is the place that O'Keefe burned her artwork she didn't want. And on the plan, it's right here. And this is a new trash can to replace the old one. This dark color area right here on the 79 plan is a compost pile for her garden. And the light area up here is that squash patch we saw back in a 79 photo. So here and here are locations of dog's graves and her chow dogs were buried over here. Firewood was stored in at least two different locations in 1979 here up against the back garden wall and a few years later right here as shown in this photograph on the upper left. There are lots of stories about how O'Keefe liked to collect rocks during her walks. So she displayed them on makeshift tables around the property as well as places inside the house. So one of the tables is right here seen in this photo. So um, just as these are just a list of the summary of the key findings that I've talked about and some potential future work. And so some of the key things are the suggestion that the property may have not have been O'Keefe's first choice, uh, the finding or resurfacing the garden plans, three of them, uh, from two from 46 and one from 48, the detailed information I shared with you about what was planted from 46 to 49, uh, getting a little bit of a better understanding of what O'Keefe, uh, which plant she liked, understanding that the character of the southeast section of the garden was different than it is today. The, that, and real learning that there was this intent to screen the views to the west and also realizing that there were important views of the pink mesa, the Don Simon mesa, and the view of the back garden from the kitchen specifically. Information about the back garden north retaining wall and that ramp, that, I think that's really interesting. And then um, also just kind of the insight into the more ephemeral objects, which provide a window into the daily life activities. And for future work, you know, uh, it would be really great to look at the full letters from the Beinecke from 42 to 45. I had the letters starting in 46, but the earlier letters could uh, provide more information about the property search. 
And then letters between O'Keefe and friends could help uh, reveal more information about the planting after she had a little bit of a falling out with uh, Chabot in 49. Uh, and, and it might reveal some insight into how it was connected to her artwork. The Chavez papers, along with research into the Trujillo, Salazar, and Manzanares families, could fill in some of the blanks about the information of the early history of the property. And it might be really interesting to study the link between the Abiquiu property and the region by mapping all of the harvesting sites, or as many as are known, for building materials and food, like the watercress that I mentioned, and you know, like the mud for the mud plaster and the adobes and the aspen poles and the stones for the wall, that kind of thing. And then also doing more research into the soil and topography and water flows as they affect the stability of the structure and the land. So thank you very much. And now it looks like we have uh, some time to take a few questions. So Shannon, back to you. Thank you, Kate. And I'm gonna stop sharing your screen. So one of the questions um, that came through um, was, is there still a lilac bush in the Abiquiu Garden and when does it bloom in Abiquiu? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yes, there are still lilacs there, uh, white and purple. And I don't know the exact bloom time. Um, that would be a really great question for Maggie. I'm sure he knows exactly, but it would be in the spring. And those lilacs that are there though, they're actually, a lot of them are transplants that uh, come from a local source. So they're not the historic lilac that I showed in the photo. Great, thank you. And so you mentioned the Chabot letters and how they're a great resource. Um, and there is a book published of them, but could you potentially clarify what was inadequate about the published version of the Chabot O'Keefe correspondence and what you found in the full letters? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so yes, there is a book that is fantastic, an excellent resource, and that's the Maria Chabot, George O'Keefe correspondence, 1946 to 1949. Um, however, it's a pretty thick book already, and the author's decided, and they, and they mentioned this in the foreword to the book, um, that they, they cut down some of the letters, so they didn't publish the entirety of all of the letters. And that was to make the, um, the book more readable, uh, and a lot of the things that they cut out were more technical information. So like the property search about, apparently Chabot might have mentioned, talked about like each of the properties in a lot of detail, and they thought maybe that information um, wouldn't be relevant to everyone. So some of that information was cut out. And so that's why the full letters are especially important because I was really looking for that technical information. And it was really helpful to say, yeah, I planted three willows in the, in the Arroyo today. And they're like, yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you. Good question. Yeah. yeah. And we scroll back up. There's quite a few questions coming in, which is great. <laughs> Keep them coming. Um, do you know anything about were there agreements and understandings about the ab between the Abiquiu residents having access to the fruit trees that existed when George O'Keefe bought the property? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I couldn't quite hear. Um, were there agreements and understandings about the Abiquiu residents having access to the fruit trees that existed oh. when O'Keefe bought the property? Um, so I'll answer that by saying, I don't know if there's anything like formal, you know, and, and I can't say like specifically which trees, but there is information, especially in the interviews where people are talking about memories that they had in the, in the area, um, the, the oral history that the museum did a while back. Um, and they, a lot of the people would remember, they tell little anecdotes about, oh, when I was a kid, we used to jump over the wall and go get the fruit. And O'Keefe did mention in one of her letters that she'd be leaving the property early one year. And she, she wrote something to the effect of, um, you know, the fruit is all ripe or the vegetables are all ripe and I'm going to have to leave and the, the neighboring little boys or kids or whatever are going to have a great time eating it all and enjoying it. Uh, so I think it was understood and acceptable. Uh, it was part of the conversation of building the wall, uh, the South Garden Wall. There was a lot of discussion about how tall the wall should be and what exactly it was doing, why build a wall. There was talk about um, 
should it screen out the neighbors or should it be a height that was low enough that people could see over? Uh, if it was taller, they were thinking maybe that would keep um, some of the people from climbing over the wall. But O'Keefe specifically said in one of the letters that she didn't want the wall to be a fortress. Uh, or to like make the property a fortress. So they did keep the wall a little bit lower to have a better interaction with the um, with the community and the views as well, that, especially the view towards the Don Simo Mesa that uh, Shibo mentioned. Mm -hmm. Great. Where did soil come from that improved the garden areas? <laughs> okay, so I don't know where the soil came from from the Chavez period, a really long time ago, just that it was brought in by the wagon loads. Um, and a lot of the soil that Chabot mentioned as far as amending the garden was manure. She talked about manure a lot. <laughs> and, and, there's, and there's like check stubs that say so-and-so um, put manure in the garden today or, or that kind of something to that effect. So a lot of the addition to the garden was um, amendments for fertil fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And there's two questions. Um, is Tierra Blanca Calici and why is the arroyo called o Ojito del Morito? <laughs> Those are great questions. You know, um, it's hard to say because the only rep, she called it Tierra Blanca. And so now we might assume, you know, what it is. It's hard to know for sure what it is. There was, there was a, a soil, a geotechnical report done and maybe that's a better question for like a soil scientist or an engineer. Um, I'm assuming, I don't know, I, I, maybe it is. I know that it was, it was really thick and hard like caliche and made kind of an impermeable barrier both for water and for the tree roots. So it was very difficult for growing. And sorry, the second, there was another part to that question. What was the second part to that question? It was... No, you, you answered both parts, I believe. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Let's see, what a question, what about Lovage? I worked for Georgia O'Keefe and that was one of her favorite spices from the garden. Do you have any information on that? Oh, that's, a, that's fantastic. You know what, um, my email that was at the end of the presentation, hopefully we can share that. I would like to get that information from you. That's, that's awesome. Um, no, I did not find anything specific about the about lovage um, however I guess the caveat to that is that I was really focused on mostly on 46 to 49 and that was kind of structuring the whole the the structure of the garden and then when O'Keefe moved in in 49 if we can get you know more information and read the letters maybe she wrote to friends that kind of thing that might provide more information about kind of what life was like in, in the house and how that related to the garden. There's lots of interviews um, talking about how she loved to grow things that were really healthy, that's pretty well documented, and how um, she took a lot of pride in sharing her food with her guests and saying, and specifically pointing out to them that a lot of the vegetables came from her garden and herbs came from her garden and things like that. So um, I would, I think maybe future interviews uh, with people who were her companions um, and others that worked on the property and reading those letters could provide some more insight into things like that, especially the more ephemeral plants that um, maybe are shorter lived or more sensitive to um, different types of maintenance and that, and that kind of thing that might have, um, might just not be there anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really great question. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate how at the end you, you gave people other research projects that someone <laughs> could go out there and do. That's really great. So many research projects. It's <laughs> fascinating. And the archive is just like a total treasure trove. It's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. And let's see. There's another question about, do you happen to know what the fuzzy mint in the garden is? <laughs> okay. Um, no, I think Margaret Menashe will hopefully be helping with that. She's like a plant expert and she's going around and verifying the identity. I did like a brief, an overview of kind of what things were and I, I measured the sizes of tree spreads and their location and that kind of thing. And then Margaret's going to go in with a finer tooth combed and say, this is this and this is that and this we think is this particular variety and this is the condition it's in and that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned mint 
because there is, um, a, in one of O'Keeffe's letters, she mentions planting mint, or, or that mint was planted outside of, uh, I forget where it was, but I think it was just right outside of this, when the south, something along the south of, of the house there. Um, and she said she liked it for mint tea. So that's a direct correlation between the plant in her garden and her eating preference. Excellent. And actually, Margaret just chimed in and said she doesn't know the species of that mint yet. Okay. Hopefully, she, she'll figure that out for us. <laughs> okay. Well, that is all we have for right now. So thank you so much, Kate. That was a wonderful talk. And thank you for tuning in today. And thank you again to our members and donors who joined us. Your support made this event possible. If you're not yet a member and enjoyed this program, please consider joining today as your gift will be matched dollar for dollar for our matching gift program. You can visit gokm.org slash membership to find out more. So thank you, Kate. Thank you all for tuning in and thanks again to the museum for this incredible opportunity and I look forward to continuing the work a little bit. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.